So one knows that G admits a faithful representation in some GL and C. In fact, one knows it goes into the unitary subgroup E1 into GL and C, which means that G lives in variant uh, inner product on Cn. We can assume that G leaves invariant the standard in a product. on Cn. <coughs> so now Cn breaks up into direct sum, orthogonal direct sum that perp that symbol denotes means orthogonal direct sum i in i rho i rho i irreducible let me write Rho i irreducible, non trivial, and 1 denotes the trivial representation. This means you have taken m copies of the trivial representation and the rest, rest of them are irreducible. Then I looked at <coughs> the following for each i, now let C be the center of G and C naught its identity connected component. Of C. <coughs> now, let's look at rho i of C naught. Rho is ir irreducible by Schur's lemma, rho i c naught has to be scalars. And therefore, if I look at determinant rho i c naught, determinant of rho i, this gives me the homomorphism from G into C star. Let us call this chi i. Chi i is a character on G, it is a homomorphism of G into C star, actually it goes into S, S1 in C star. So determinant rho i, I call chi i, chi i is a character on G to S1. And we know that rho i Now we know we know that the representation rho is faithful, which implies that the kernel determinant rho i, this intersection intersect to the center is finite. This is because the representation rho i are faithful, but when I compose the determinant or the center, everything gets raised to some power, namely the dimension of the vector space vi. And because of that, there, so it can acquire extra kernel, which we but a finite kernel. So it, this, this implies this kernel is finite. <coughs> and if I set uh, the rep, direct sum of determinant rho i equal to say some lambda i in i. <coughs> then kernel lambda is finite and I, I will in fact intersect with C naught kernel lambda is finite which implies the induced map lambda dot 
of the linear algebra G to yeah. Uh, not saying it right. Yeah. And I say kernel lambda restricted to C is finite. So lambda dot restricted to sorry this, this okay kernel lambda restricted to c is finite and let's look at lambda dot it's a home of, this is a mapping of g into <coughs> so many copies of s1 which means the Lie algebra is r so r power l where l is the well we have to you know, I'm not saying it quite right. What what I want is following, yeah, in, into some R L is the number of elements in I. <coughs> Claim the kernel kernel lambda itself in G is a closed obviously is a closed subgroup closed normal subgroup whose Lie algebra is bracket gg <coughs> now And it follows, hence, I will come to this presently. Hence, G is the algebra of C, direct sum. This is the kernel, and <coughs> this is the kernel of the home of the On C, the mapping lambda dot is. Uh, um, is injective, so you find this G is equal to the algebra of C plus bracket GG. Okay. Now that the Lie algebra is bracket GG is clear. From, if you look at the kernel, it's a group <coughs> which is uh, such that the quotient is abelian. Because this this uh, chi i are all characters, so the quotient is abelian, and therefore it follows that uh, the kernel is contained in the commutator uh, contains the commutator subgroup of G, and therefore it will contain the commutator algebra here, okay. and that the it's Lie algebra is the commutator Lie algebra here, and it's not uh, it's quite easy to see that it coincides with bracket GG. So that is why it is a direct sum. So it is a little tricky but I will leave it out, I do not want to go into details. But this is true, G is C plus bracket G. I am using the fact that the group is compact because I have used the fact that it is completely reducible. And <coughs> so the Lie algebra breaks up into this. And what is more, it follows that the Lie subgroup corresponding to bracket GG. is a closed subgroup of G because the group is the kernel of lambda yeah kernel lambda in G is a closed normal subgroup so and that is precisely the subgroup corresponding to bracket GG okay actually it is a general result that uh, in a connected Lie group bracket GG is a Lie subgroup the corresponding Lie three subalgebra being bracket GG. In the case of compact, you can prove this without going through the entire Lie theory. But if you are, uh, if you feel comfortable about using Lie theory, it's direct follow directly follows from that. <coughs> okay, so the point is that so you get a subgroup. 
is a closed subgroup of bracket GG in equal to the commutator subgroup GG because the commutator subgroup <coughs> is connected. Notice that the commutator subgroup is connected and its real algebra is necessarily bracket GG. Okay. So what has happened is this. So now I claim that G it follows from the fact that the real algebra is C plus bracket GG and the fact that the group is connected that G becomes equal to C times bracket GG. These are both normal subgroups. This is a center. Uh, the connected component is the identity in the center and this is the commutator subgroup. So the group G breaks up into this fashion C into bracket GG. In general, the commutator subgroup need not be closed. This is a phenomenon which works in the compact case. Compact Lie group, this is a definition. is semi simple if g equal to bracket gg this is not a standard definition but making this so theorem g compact connected always connected semi simple if and only if <coughs> I mean maybe the right way to say is the following conditions are equivalent okay if and only if G has finite center G equal to bracket GG is same thing as G having finite center. That follows from this fact. If G is compact, then it breaks up into this. The center is finite, center is 0. So G becomes equal to bracket GG. And the converse, if G has finite center, that means C is 0. The, the, the converse is clear because, I mean, the converse is statement with the definition of some simplicity. G equals bracket GG. <coughs> if G has finite center, G equal to bracket GG is what you have said. And it is another result is that G compact, yeah, sorry, let me make a definition. G connected compact is simple if it has no proper connected closed normal subgroups. In particular, the, it has the center is in particular the center is finite because center is a no, closed normal subgroup, which implies <coughs> it is semi simple. G is necessarily semi simple with this definition. And then theorem any compact connected Lie group is an almost direct product of a torus and a finite collection of compact simple groups why is that <coughs> we know we know that c is an almost direct product of uh, g is a almost direct product of its center 
of the identity connected component of the center and a some simple group. That is what we just now saw. So, G a priori compact connected. So, G is almost direct product. of C times G prime where G prime is semi simple compact and C is a torus almost direct product means it is of the form C cross G modular finite central subgroup the central subgroup may sit diagonally may have components in both. So, so, it is enough to prove the theorem under the assumption G prime is simple, it is a semi simple. So, under the assumption G is semi simple. So, can therefore assume G is semi simple. Let us look at the adjoint representation to G or G. It is represented over real numbers. Now, <coughs> this representation is completely reducible, means that is, so G breaks up to direct some gi where each gi is at g stable at g or the adjoint of the Lie algebra at g stable and is irreducible under at g. How does at g operate? It operates by taking, if you take an element of x in g, it operates on any g i by simply taking the bracket. That means each g i is an ideal. This implies every g i is a minimal ideal because we are assuming assume it is only fit at a smaller ideal then that would also it will contradict the irreducibility. G i is a minimal ideal in G. Now define G i to be set of elements the identity connected component of the, let me first G i star let me write G i star to be a set of elements G in G such that at G of <coughs> at G x is 0 for every x not in G i, x in G j, j not equal to i. This gives you a closed subgroup of the group G because the condition is obviously a closed condition at g x sorry equals x for u x and I define g i as the identity connected component of g i star. Then it is clear that the Lie algebra of g i is precisely German G i, the Gothic G i. Yeah, the algebra of G i is G. Because the Lie algebra is characterized as all those elements x in the Lie algebra, sorry, a in the Lie algebra such that add a x 0 that will be the condition which is clearly sub, sub G, the G i G j all commute with oh yeah you can say that this is an ideal. So, G i bracket G j will be contained in both G i and G j it is a direct sum. So, the intersection is 0. So, they commute with each other that is why this works. So, you find the G i graph G i is G i and it is also clear from, from the fact that G i intersection G j j not equal to i is 0 implies g i intersection g 
product g j j not equal to i is finite because the corresponding Lie algebra is 0 the group is finite and therefore it follows that and as I said already I know that g i and g j commute you find not equal to j which implies <coughs> hence g the same simple g is a direct product of it is almost direct product of g i i in i and then the that is that is a same simple case but as I already remarked general compact connected case follows the same simple case as we see. So that proves the theorem that any compactly group is an almost direct product of a torus and a finite collection of compact simple groups. This obviously shows that the study of a general compact group can be reduced to the case of a simple simple group of a, in fact of a simple group that is what it amounts to. So I will now concentrate on in the, with concentrate on the case when g is simple from now on until unless I, I specify otherwise g will mean compact simple Lie group which as we have seen implies center g is finite and g equal to bracket g g. This as a group you do not have to you can forget the topology g is equal to bracket g g as simply a group. <coughs> so this where we are and now let t be a so in such situation let t be a maximal torus in G. We have already seen that all maximal tori in G are conjugates. Now I want to look at the map and we so <coughs> we know that T a maximal torus we know that every every G in G has a conjugate in T. These two things we have seen before which means if you look at the mapping g cross t to g namely the mapping g comma t goes into g t g inverse the map is on to. Now look at the adjoint representation <coughs> this is just a reinterpretation of the statement. Now I want to look at the adjoint representation. Now also notice that this, this factors, this factors through <coughs> yeah this factors through g by centralizer of g by t cross t to g because if I modify the mapping is g going to g t g inverse g t going to g t inverse if I modify g by g x where x is in the torus I want to g x t x inverse g inverse and that will be same as g t inverse. So the mapping factors through this notice that these two manifolds are the same dimension and in fact it is by so proving that the degree of the map is non-zero that we prove the mapping is subjective. This part. And now if I look at the I, let me yeah an element T in T is regular that is a definition if the centralizer of T is 
centralizer Z T of T is all of T. Centralizer of Z G T in G of T in G is just T equals T. There are regular elements. Any generator of a torus is obviously a regular element. If something centralizes the regulator, the generator then centralizes the entire torus. But a much weaker condition will do the job. Namely, for this you have to look at the decomposition of the Lie algebra as a under the adjoint representation. Look at G. Look at the Lie algebra. Lie algebra of G. And you have the torus T. T composes under T and the adjoint representation of T that is I look at the adjoint representation of the big group and restricted to T of G restricted to T as a sum of the sum the Lie algebra of T which is the sum of all the trivial representation occurring there plus sum of certain number of representations of T which are irreducible alpha and delta and right where delta where, where G alpha is of the following form where, okay, where alpha is a character which goes from T to S1 which is the circle is that okay now so i will write alpha t to be some uh, i i will write alpha t to be theta well, by which i mean it's c per i theta the reason i am writing like this is the following these are real representations these are real irreducible representation and any real irreducible representation is necessarily if it is not trivial it is necessarily two dimensional because the reason is that you take a complex representation it is one dimensional by Schur's lemma. Now take a real representation tensor with C take real irreducible tensor with C then the subspaces of the original representation are correspond to Galois stable subspaces of the representation tensor with C. The Galois group now is element of so group of order 2. So and take the non-trivial element call it sigma you get a conjugation. So you are looking for if you want a subspace which is stable under the group you have to take something which is stable under the group and sigma stable in the in the complexification. So if you take any vector v take a sigma stable subspace which is one dimensional apply sigma you get another one dimensional space together you get a two dimensional space or it may be the one dimensional space is already sigma stable. So what you that is why you will get some trivial sometimes you will get trivial representations which are one dimensional. So the statement is the following an irreducible representation of, tor of a torus is either trivial and one dimensional or dimension two dimensions or of dimension two in which case it is irreducible. What really happens is this so what is if <coughs> when I take such a character what what is the corresponding representation g alpha you <coughs> has the on g alpha okay g alpha admits a basis Or R such that alpha <coughs> of uh, 
any matrix x in 0 x in the torus t sorry alpha t this is the form well this is a 2 cross 2 matrix so cos alpha t sin alpha t minus sin alpha t cos alpha t this if you go to the com uh, complex and bus decomposes into the representation given by alpha t the character and alpha t inverse instead of alpha t is in element theta then you also take alpha t inverse which is e power minus i theta. So in two dimensional representations a certain character occurs along with its conjugate okay in the two dimensional irreducible representation. So the whole thing may be I am sorry about notation I, I do not see in alternative some bunch of characters notice that when I write this g alpha it is same as g minus alpha g minus this g alpha includes g minus alpha each of them is two dimensional alpha is a character in delta alpha is a character on the torus I have fixed a certain number of characters and <coughs> the along with alpha you see if you look at this if you change this alpha t to minus alpha t these two things get interchanged that is all that happens which means the basis is changed. So the representation where I write when I write g alpha it also stands for g minus alpha if you like the two things are the same. <coughs> so if you like representations uh, of uh, <coughs> over irreducible representations over reals are characters by pairs alpha minus alpha which are characters in the uh, of irreducible representations over complex numbers. Okay, so it becomes like this, which means if I take an element, so an element is regular if this happens, if uh, yeah, uh, if T in T is not regular. In this case, it is called similar. Then there exists alpha t, there exists alpha in delta such that alpha t equal to 1. If it is not regular, the, Regularity means the centralizer has been entire torus. How do I get this? If you look at uh, the in the Lie's way, if you look at the centralizer, what does it look like? It looks like <coughs> you know it, it has you want to know when t acts trivially on one of these. Here this is the sorry the should be t. So torus in here everything acts trivially. So that is the centralizer, but Otherwise, some alpha t has to be 1, only then you will get a vector fixed by it, which means in the group centralized will be larger rather than the torus. So, this which shows this is, this is clear that is, if, if t is not a regular element, that is, if it is a singular element, then that there exists alpha and delta that alpha t equal to 1. If alpha t is not equal to 1, none of this will be in the centralizer, none of the g alphas will be in the centralizer. So, centralizer will have to be the torus. If we, so, <coughs> t is singular this happens. Notice that this implies if t is singular, centralizer of t is of, sorry, the central, the algebra of centralizer of t, the algebra of C T is is of uh, <coughs> dimension greater than or equal to dimension T plus two. 
because each G alpha is dimension 2, we will take the centralizer, if some G alpha will, if the centralizer is bigger than T, some G alpha will have to fall into the centralizer and then the dimension of the centralizer increases at least by 2. Okay. It may be more because G alpha is contributes to dimension 2 and G beta will contribute to dimension 2 so long as alpha and beta are not multiples of each other, rational multiples of each other. Okay, so the dimension is at least greater than T plus 2. This implies if you look at G cross T sorry uh, G by T cross T to G if you uh, look at uh, let T alpha denote the kernel of alpha then you look at G by if you look at G cross T alpha restrict this map G G cross T to G to G cross T alpha to G then it factors through G by centralizer of T alpha cross T earlier when you took a regular element I mean when you took the, when you took the full torus G by T cross T G cross T to G will factor through G by T now I am taking T alpha which is the kernel which consists entirely of singular elements and this mapping <coughs> clearly factors through G by C, Z T alpha. Okay. Now, <coughs> the point I want to make is the following, the, the image, so lemma, the image of the set of, uh, sorry not the image, the set of singular elements Oh, uh, sorry. The let me make a definition. An element in G is singular. If it is conjugate. to a single element the torus and it is similarly it is regular respectively singular if it is conjugate to a regular respect to a single element of the torus. Okay. <coughs> now, among the single elements, uh, among the single elements T alpha, there are, there are some which is most regular so to speak that is you look at this map G by Z T alpha cross T alpha take those points of T alpha where this mapping is of highest rank possible. It's a, it's a, it will never be on the, at the tangent space level this mapping will be never be subjective because this has got at least dimension T alpha plus 2 less than G, G and this is only of dimension T alpha so if you add up it is not going to work right. So, the singular elements, the point is, the singular, let me, maybe I will give this a name, phi alpha, the singular elements in G is the union alpha and delta and image phi alpha that gives you all the singular elements in the group. The point is this set yes is a union of locally closed 
submanifolds of dimension of co dimension is a finite union co dimension greater than or equal to 2. <coughs> See in fact greater than or equal to 3. T alpha itself is 1 dimension less than T and G by Z T alpha is 2 dimensions less than G. So, when you take this part you, you get you lose 2 dimensions here you lose 1 dimension there and therefore you get only co dimension 3 the whole thing is co dimension 3. <coughs> It is a union of submanifolds. I mean the point is to what, what you do is to apply the rank theorem that is you take the set of points of maximum possible rank here you th that will be an open set in Z by Z T alpha cross T alpha and that image is a, is a submanifold because of rank theorem and of co-dimension uh, at least 3 and then take points here which are not which are of even lower rank where the tangent map is of lower rank and of lower rank and maximum possible and of, the, of those lower rank things that will give you by the rank theorem that will give you image will be a submanifold which is a dimension co dimension certainly greater than equal to 3 and so on the whole thing is becomes a union of submanifolds you have to go down only I mean you have to go down <coughs> only the number of dimensions of the torus if the dimension of the torus you do not have to go beyond L of these things. So, in any case that is why it is a uh, it is a closed submanifold of co dimension greater than equal to 3. Now, I have to quote the theorem from topology. So, theorem from, from the theorem from topology implies the following thing pi 1 of G minus a singular set to pi 1 G. This is an isomorphism. That is, in other words, what you, you have mapping of the circle into the group that can be moved continuously into a mapping into G minus S. That is what it says. <coughs> and pi 2 G minus S to pi 2 G is on 2. Right. Now let me first assume let assume the G has trivial center. Our group is uh, Our, our, our group is compact semi simple, so it has finite center. So I pass to the quotient with that center, then you won't get any further center. It requires a little bit of checking, but it's true. <coughs> Assume that G has trivial center. Under that assumption, I will prove the statements. <coughs> I mean, I, I won't prove the statement. I want to assume these statements. What does it mean? Now, if G has trivial center, and let The consider the consider the set delta. This has characters say alpha one etc. Alpha r. Now, the set of characters on <coughs> T is isomorphic to a free abelian group Z L. L is the rank of the torus, dimension of the torus. T is a product of S1 cross S1 L times. So, if you look at the characters, they are given by n triples of integers. And so, this is a small zero. Now, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha r, I take the, this gives a subgroup of this. And a free subgroup of free group is free, and I can choose from alpha 1, etc., alpha r choose alpha 1 alpha l such that 
span of alpha i z span equals t and alpha i linearly choose alpha linearly independent and we know that the kernel of all the alpha i's you know, all the alpha and delta is simply the same as the kernel of the this collection because this generates the whole lot of it and we also know that uh, these characters we know that uh, we, the way alpha and alpha to, uh, are, these are characters which occur in the adjoint representation and the adjoint representation in the case of uh, uh, group which has no center is faithful. So alpha and alpha to alpha will have to be uh, the, uh, will have to be span will generate whole of xt all, all, they will generate all characters okay, because the adjoint representation is faithful it is faithful on t and but which means that these characters are faithful. So, alpha and alpha to alpha will actually give you a isomorphism of T okay. so an isomorphism which is given by alpha and alpha L, which means T minus regular elements equals S1 minus 1 it is going to look like that which means it is a product of intervals to drop the from the circle of drop line it is going to be product of L4 product now we are taking singular no. now look at this mapping T minus t regular sorry t singular <coughs> sorry this is t minus sing singular elements that is regular elements in t take the regular element, element which is same thing as t minus singular elements which is therefore isomorphic 0 1 cross L. Now take T regular cross G minus T this maps into G regular and this mapping has finite fibers as a, in fact this is nothing but the, in fact this is a covering with while group as a fiber see on g mod t the while group operates and if you take a regular element the while group will take that into regular element so t regular cross g mod t to g regular so covering map with w as the group uh, depth transformation group okay so this is a finite covering and so if you look at I one of this, it's uh, it's the same thing as pi one of this with extended by W. That's what the fundamental group of this extended by this. So <coughs> what is the fundamental group of this? T regular is a contractible space, is product of Z one L, and at the, at this point we don't know what the fundamental group G mod T is, but now mind what the point? The point is that so if you take this, if you lift, you take a mapping S1 to G and that lifts to this. 
there is a mapping into that and there is a mapping into this as well. But the mapping into this can be contracted to a single point, which means when I take the image here, that can be contracted to a single point. So you have to be a little careful because when you contract it to a single point here, you look at the conjugation, it may go into, it may not, the image, the point, so no, the point, the, the problem is that the grid does not contain the identity, okay. But that does not matter, you can add the identity, identity element which means you put in 1, 1, 1 diagonally and you can then still see that every element of this can be, uh, the, the, any mapping here is first of all can be homotopped into a single point and the single point can be dragged to 1 because 1 is in the closer of any one, all this business. So you can get into 1 to 1 and then take the image. That obviously is the same as the original thing was lifted and you have taken a homotopy and then you applied this. So the new one will be homotopic. But when you take this at the one at the end of the homotopy, it's the element one always. When you conjugate it makes no difference, you get one. So the mapping of the circle here is homotop into a constant map in one. Okay. So that shows that the fundamental group of G regular is same as the fundamental group of this extended by W which is fundamental group of this which is trivial as we have seen. So, I mean every element can be contracted. So the, fun, the fundamental group of this is, is therefore finite and therefore the fundamental group of G itself is finite because it is an isomorphism. Okay. do not look very convinced, but I am going to leave it at that. I think it over, it will be clear. It, uh, if I say more, I will only confuse you further, I think. <laughs> I leave it there. The point is, this is an isomorphism. So, and next, what about pi 2? Similar argument tells you that pi 2 g is 0, because pi 2 of this is 0, pi 2 of g regular therefore is 0. It is a covering, pi 2 of the 2 are the same pi 2 of this is 0, therefore pi 2 of this is 0, okay. not, not, this is not quite 0, sorry, pi 2 of this is not 0, but here you can contract it to 0 and then the same argument by conjugation at the other end you will get yeah, all, the, all the time it is 1, other end of the map it is all the time 1, so when you conjugate it is always 1, it does not quite, sorry, it, it, when I do the conjugation it does not go quite into G regular, the original map S1 goes into G regular. I will lift it, I will, so it goes into, yeah, the original map F goes into G regular which, which therefore can be lifted. After lifting, uh, by adding 1 I can make it homotopically trivial on this factor and then you take the image here. Then it becomes homotopically trivial here as well because at the, the end it is always 1 which when you conjugate you get 1 all the time. So, actually the, the, what, what was proved is that in G regular any element is homotopic to 0, pi, any element in pi 1 is trivial and therefore since this is an isomorphism, <coughs> no sorry I must say it is finite because the, in the lifting process you, you need you get the while group involved in this. So, in the, all that you can say is that the that mapping is an isomorphism but all that you have got out of this, doing this is to say after lifting here it becomes, you know the fundamental, it is a fundamental group of this extended by W is what you are going to get. So, you get only a finite group there. So, the fundamental group of pi 1 g is, fi is finite as a conclusion because it is an isomorphism you find that this is finite. And what about pi 2, pi 2 g minus says to pi 2 g is on 2, but here pi 2 g becomes 0 here. For the for the torus, pi two is zero in any case. So pi two is zero. Therefore, you find that <coughs> yeah, the right way to say these things is one moment. Let me put it like this. So you G mod T is simply uh, what, sorry. What is pi one of G mod T? G, G mod T. G, I I don't. I'm not interested in pi one of G mod T now. Oh, 
it is simply connected as a matter of fact. GMRT is actually simply connected, but I don't want to go into that. I want to I want to say you this lift to lift this lifts to T regular, and then you can go to T cross G mod T. The mapping into T regular can be homotopy into a constant map in T with constant map taking the early identity, and then you go for back now this. So when you uh, after lifting by W, it's become homotopically tri trivial. So that's why the thing is okay. <coughs> So, I am actually studying over something, but you go back and th think over it, you will see how to handle this. Now, uh, for pi 2, something similar, to, you use the fact that it is on 2, and then you use the fact that pi 2 of uh, t is 0. For the torus, uh, pi 2 is 0. Pi 2 of the torus is same as pi 2 of the universal covering, which is Euclidean space, so it is uh, trivial. So, this as a consequence so what we have proved is the following theorem G compact connected semi simple I put, made these statements in the case of simple groups but semi simple it is an obvious uh, extension semi simple then pi 1 g is finite and pi 2 g is 0. The first statement pi 1 g is finite is due to Hermann Weyl, the second statement is due to Karta. Actually so Hermann Weyl used this argument is that this is an isomorphism and then Kata observed okay it also works for pi 2 because pi 2 is it is subjective and so I can calculate pi 2 and pi 2 g is 0. So this is Kata and this is y. One consequence roughly how did you use this alternates of pi 2 to conclude pi 2 of that is 0 or how, how did you invoke this? Theorem on pi 2 to conclude pi 2 of g 0. It is the same, same thing, same idea. Go to t that where pi 2 t is 0. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I can compress it to a point to identity and the conjugation map takes it back to 0. So <coughs> t regular, okay. okay. I mean, it goes into because the mapping goes into g regular, I, I need only to prove the mapping is from top to 0, it is enough to prove that every element in this goes to 0 here. That is all that I have to prove. I do not have to prove it is 0 here itself. Yeah. I have to prove that it goes to 0 there. Yeah. And since it is on 2 then I am done. By 2 g minus s I will do this business of lifting and in the torus I make it from top to 0 and then look at the in G mod T, if it is done by conjugation, so the identity element is always goes into single element. So, you get a homotopy between the original map and the new map which is constant. So, I lifted here and then look at the image. I know that the mapping is subjective, the lifted thing actually goes to 0. So, I am done. So, lifting a map from S2? Huh? Lifting a map from S2? Yeah, from S2, yeah. S2 to, I look at a map from S2 to G regular and lift it here and go back there. Okay. So, in fact, while it is a, there is a famous theorem in about Lie algebras, there is the notion of G being a G semi-simple Lie algebra, real semi-simple Lie algebra. Then every finite dimensional representation is completely reducible. Completely reducible is a famous theorem about some simple Lie algebras. Well, Hermann Weyl proved this theorem first. But now there are purely algebraic proofs. 
essentially due to J.H.C. Whitehead, who is really a topologist, but apparently strayed into this and proved the theorem. Anyway, every finite number of representation is completely reducible for a semi simple algebra. Whale's idea was this you take G, which is the semi simple algebra over R, now mind what it is, and look at G tensor C over R, which I call GC. It turns out this is isomorphic to K tensor C over R, where K is Lie algebra of a compact group, of a compact semi simple group. <coughs> the point is that GC actually is isomorphic to K tensor C over R. I mean, that requires a De, some de, delicate arguments is proved by Hermann Weil. He proved this business. And now, if you take a representation of this group, it gives you a representation of this Lie algebra. Now, I mean, so you take a representation of the Lie algebra G, it gives a representation after tensoring with C, you get a representation of GC. And then, but GC comes from here. So, it comes from a representation of K. The origin, therefore, the original representation, uh, it's, it's, you can assume the representation, the representation is over R, but to, if you tensor with C, you can start with the representation over C. The Lie algebra is over R, but take a representation over C. That's, and then if you tensor with C, you get a representation of GC, but GC happens to be like this. And therefore, you get a representation of K over C. And now, K over C gives rise to the representation of the corresponding Lie group over C. But uh, you cannot take any Lie group, but simply connected group, if you take that's general theory of Lie algebra. So we have a home of Lie algebra into another, suppose G, G prime of Lie algebra and if you have a home of G to G prime. And G is a simply connected Lie group corresponding to G and G prime is the only Lie group corresponding to G prime. Then you can integrate the representation to get a representation of G in G prime. That is part essentially fundamental theorem of Lie theory. Because of that, this representation can be integrated to a representation of the compact group of the simple connected group corresponding to K. But we know that the simple connected group corresponding to K is compact because pi 1 of any simple simple group is finite. So, the simply connected covering group is only a finite covering, therefore the group is compact. The group is compact and therefore its representation is completely reducible. That is a completely reducible means the representation of GC you get as completely reducible, but that comes from a representation of G, therefore it is completely reducible. This is uh, usually called Weil's unitary trick. The point is, if you want to take, uh, in the case, special case of a Lie algebra like SL and R, which is a simple Lie algebra, if you tensor with C, you will get SL and C, but SL and C is same thing as the Lie algebra of UN tensored with C. So, representation of SL and R, can, every representation of R can be read as representation of SUN. SU, and SUN is a simply connected compact group. So, every representation is completely reducible. Therefore, every representation of J L and C is completely reducible. Therefore, every representation of G is complete. That is the uh, argument of Hermann Weil to prove complete reducibility. But anyway, this is uh, in some sense a digression. Okay, now. So, so, you said this part is tricky um, to show that K is the Lie algebra of a compact semi simple group. This is not so obvious. Yeah, this is the. this. Analyze the structure of a simple simple algebra in great detail. You, you know, you have to use roots and weights, and then you, you can construct a new solution and things of that kind. That's more, that's delicate. It's not easy. Okay, now that said, that pi two g equals zero. I'm going to use now to prove the following. Let G be a compact simple semi simple Lie group of rank one. That means the dimension of maximal torus is one. Then 
G is isomorphic to SU2 or SO3. Notice that SU2 is a true sheet covering of SO3. SU2 is simply connected, SO3 is fundamental group. The way you realize this is the following think of uh, <coughs> SU2 can be thought of as unit quaternions. The group of unit quaternions, so if you take quaternions, you can think of it as a vector space over C or R. Think of it as a vector space over C, then SU2 can be identified with unit quaternions. And now look at SU2 as a, it's a really group, it's not a complexity group. It's a, what's the dimension? It's precisely 3. And look at the adjoint representative SU2. So you get a three dimensional representation which will leave invariant some uh, inner product which means it maps into SO3. SO3 has dimension 3, SU2 has dimension 3. So you find the two, it's a covering map, it's a two sheeted covering. And so that is why G is isomorphic to SU2 or SO3, they are the only possibilities. SO3 has no center, SU2 has center plus minus identity. So these are the only possible groups. How does the proof go? Let us look at the adjoint representation. Yeah, so you have, uh, yeah. of G on the real algebra G. Let us assume the dimension of G equal to n. We have to prove that n equals 3. Now T is a maximal torus. You have G acts on the Lie algebra and if you fix a vector V in G which is regular. In fact, fits any vector v, v in G. And look at the orbit G going to GV. Uh, take the, in fact, you take the vector to be, yeah, take a vector v in T, unit vector, for some in you know, a part which is left invariant by G, take norm v equal to 1. Look at G to GV. This is a mapping of the group G. <coughs> it gives you a mapping of uh, G mod T into unit vectors in G mapping into SN minus 1. So dimension n SN minus 1. Notice that this is also dimension n minus 1. Okay. okay. G is of dimension n t is of dimension 1, it's assumption of rank is 1. So this is also of dimension n minus 1 and it is clear that the mapping, the it is also clear that the mapping is of maximal rank, rank is always n minus 1 because if you look at look at those g, x, x in t, x, x v equals 0, the only possibility if x v is 0, v is in the torus, if I add x v is 0 with x in the Lie algebra, that x will have to be in the torus because t is maximal. Anything commuting with that will have to lie in that. So this is open map, this is a compact space onto the sphere. So the image is both open and close, so it must be the whole of the sphere. So this this is a homeomorphism. So in fact this is a so G is fibered over S n minus one with T as a fiber. Now if n is not equal to 2, this vibration is necessarily trivial. See the point is that <coughs> the circle vibrations is again some topology on a sphere SP, SQ are isomorphism classes of circle, isomorphism classes of circle vibration on SQ are in bijective to correspondence with 
pi q minus 1 of uh, sorry uh, pi q minus 1 of s1 a circle vibration shall so bijet correspond pi q minus 1 of s1 the point is you have this uh, sphere you take the equatorial sphere here which is sq minus 1 and on the, the two discs the on contractible spaces all bundles are trivial so you get a trivial bundle the two are patched up by means of a mapping of the middle thing into the into the automorphism circle into the circle in this case and the mappings of so if it is pi i of the circle is 0 except for i equal to 1. So it will go into automorphisms of the circle? No, no it is actually circle, is circle vibration is the principal vibration. So the patching is by you have two discs the patching is by element of the group which ah, so it is a principal S1 bundle. When I say S1 bundle, I mean principal S1 bundle. So it's the isomorphism is then budget correspondence with pi q minus one S1, which is zero except when q equal to two. So the vibration, so when this vibration is trivial, except when, but when the vibration is trivial, you write the homotopy exact sequence, and you find that uh, you get into a contradiction. Okay. The five, so the point, except in the case the vibration is trivial which means uh, G becomes a product of SN minus 1 and T but G has finite fundamental group and T has non-trivial fundamental group, Z as the fundamental group. So if the vibration is trivial unless N equal to 2 and if N is not equal to 2 the, N is not equal to 2, the vibration is sorry if uh, N minus 1 is not equal to 2 the vibration is trivial that would mean that it is a part that would mean the G is a part of SN minus 1 and T which means the fundamental group is non trivial is, is the infinite which gives you a contradiction. So once again uh, I am using a certain amount of topology which uh, for this purpose the, there, are, there are purely algebraic arguments which we, which we can get over this but then it will work entirely with Lie algebras not with the group. So the, let me explain that. So this isomorphism classes of principal S1 vibrations are in bijective correspondence oh, on SQ on SN minus 1 are in bijective correspondence with pi N minus 2 of S1. <coughs> so this implies if n not equal to 2 this vibration is trivial G becomes therefore topologically the product of Sn minus 1 cross T. And if n not equal to 2, this implies pi 1 of g is isomorphic to pi 1 of t, a contradiction to the finiteness of pi 1 of pi 1 g will prove is finite so you get a contradiction to the finiteness of pi 1 g. 
it becomes S n minus 1 cross 2. If n is not equal to 2, you, uh, yeah, if n is not equal to 2, you are going to get uh, here either yes, I mean, yeah, S n minus 1 will have will be simply connected. Cross T, you get the same animal group. <coughs> Except when it, n equals 1, it is not con it's not connected, but it will get two, two points. Uh, the group can, has to be connected, so that won't work. In. Anyway, n cannot be equal to 1. S not is two points. So that shows this this whole thing shows that if G is a compact sensible group, so what's happened is this you got the mapping G to at G. So this is contained in S O N minus one now it has become S O N equal to two, therefore it becomes S O three. N minus one equals two, so it goes into S O three. And which shows that, uh, and G being <coughs> a joint represents faithful because G is a simple Lie group, and therefore, if you look at the uh, in, in semi simple Lie group, therefore, this mapping this also of dimension 3, this also of dimension 3, so the kernel is finite, and the only possibility is that, that means the G is a covering of SO3, and there is only one covering SO3, namely SU2. So, the only possibilities are SO3 and SU2. Any three dimensional group is isomorphic to SU3 and SO2. And one knows the structure of uh, the, Lie, the group SU2 very well or SO3. If you look at the Lie algebra and it has uh, the Lie, we'll, one, one has a very good description. And then one can also describe all the representations of SO3 or, or of SU2 very clearly. And we'll put these two things together to get more about the structure of the general semi simple Lie algebra. And from there go on to describe the representation theory. So, the next step for, for us is to describe the representation theory of SU2 and describe the representation theory and from then we will go on to describe the, uh, the say something more about the structure of a general semi-simple algebra and it is their representations. The key is held by the structure of rank 1 groups and then the representations of rank 1 groups namely SU2 essentially. I think this is an appropriate point for me to stop. <coughs>